in the grand finale of The Revenge of the Sith, Anakin Skywalker says to Obi-Wan, from my point of view, the Jedi are evil. He's not wrong. Because in the opening of The Phantom Menace, the Jedi aren't sent to free Anakin from slavery. They're sent to deal with an economic blockade. And that right there shows the priorities of the Republic and the Jedi writ large, who are clearly their enforcers. It doesn't necessarily showcase evil on the part of the Jedi, but it also doesn't quite line up with the Jedi's propaganda machine. Because Obi-Wan Kenobi and his master Qui-Gon Jinn stumble upon a 10-year-old Anakin Skywalker by sheer accident. And they're not really interested in this kid in the slightest until he invites them over to get out of the sandstorm. Which means this kid was looking at them. He saw who they were. He realized they were a Jedi and said, Oh, they're my ticket out of slavery. Because the story he heard about the Jedi was the propaganda story about noble space knights and not enforcement soldiers. And this is very clear when he's having dinner with Qui-Gon Jinn because he asked, have you come here to free all the slaves? And Qui-Gon says, no, I have not. But Anakin looks at him sideways and says, I think you have. Because this is the first taste of hope Anakin has had in a long time. And he refuses to let it go. It's a little slave boy clinging to the hope of freedom. And he's desperate to be free. Because he offers to fix Qui-Gon's ship. And then he offers to raise the money to get the parts to fix Qui-Gon's ship. During the pod racing event, he's desperate to get out. And his mother, Shimi Skywalker, is desperate to get out. Because she sees the interest Qui-Gon is showing in her son. Qui-Gon believes that Anakin Skywalker is the prophesized chosen one. Destined to bring balance to the Force. And there's this potent sadness in Shimi Skywalker when Anakin fixes his pod racer and yells, It's working! Because she knows that this is her son's one ticket out of slavery. And her pushing this is the only thing she can do for him. She knows that if he manages to convince the Jedi to take the boy, she'll never see him again. But she'll die happy knowing that her son made it out. And she's smart enough to know that the Jedi won't take her to because there's nothing in it for them. And this is shown right before the pod race when Qui-Gon is negotiating with Watto and says, I'll wager my new pod against the boy and his mother. But this is a ruse. He knows Watto won't let both go. So when Watto says, only the boy, Qui-Gon really gets what he wants there. And once Anakin wins the race along with his freedom, the boy asks his mom if he can go with Qui-Gon Jinn to be a Jedi. And he doesn't realize the difference his freedom makes because he's asking for permission from his mother, but he already has more agency in his life than she can ever grant him. And the last thing he says to his mother before he leaves to go to the Jedi Temple in Coruscant to audition to be trained as a Jedi is promising to come back and free her. So there's a part of me that thinks if Qui-Gon Jinn really was a good guy, he'd cut off Watto's head, and then they'd kill everybody in their way to get Shimi Skywalker out too. And if not just on moral grounds, then based on the idea that you've got this traumatized little slave boy with the weight of the world on his shoulders, and... He's apparently your chosen one space wizard messiah. And so maybe to keep him stable and steady after coming from the horrific trauma of slavery and poverty, take his mother as a sense of continuity for the boy. The Jedi are all about feelings. The fact that they messed this part up boggles my mind. But maybe they're about their own feelings and not this thing called empathy. <laughs> Because the Jedi Council never wanted to take Anakin on in the first place. They originally tell Qui-Gon no, but he makes it happen anyway. Because Qui-Gon believes in the prophecy. 
And I don't think that the Jedi Council believe in much more than their own importance and authority. Because throughout the entire prequel trilogy, their distrust, mistrust, resentment of Anakin Skywalker is evident throughout the entire thing. And they say, oh, it's because there's anger and fear in him. Of course there's anger and fear in him. <laughs> you don't minimize the bad emotions. You understand the bad emotions and you integrate them into your operating center. You don't say, oh, well, that guy's full of anger and fear, so maybe we should keep him at arm's length. Well, that just makes people feel angry, fearful, and isolated. Good job, Yoda. And they go deeper into Anakin's desire to belong to a Space Knight army that never really wanted him in the first place. In Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. And Anakin Skywalker at age 19 feels like the natural evolution of a boy who was raised in the lion's den. And he made it out of the lion's den, but he can always feel the breath of the lion on his ear so he runs as fast as he can from the lion that will always be chasing him because he sees the world through the application of brute force because when you're at the bottom the social contract of advocating violence to the state is not really in play so brute force solves most disputes when he's with Padme at her romantic beach house on Naboo he suggests to her that the government system of the Republic does not work. That they need to figure out what's best for the people and then make it happen. She tells him sometimes the people don't agree. And then he says, well, maybe they should be made to. And then she tells him, well, that sounds an awful lot like a dictatorship to me. And then he smiles and says, well, you know, if it works. Because what has democracy gotten him, really? Democracy didn't get him out of slavery. He got himself out of slavery. Anakin knew what he wanted, and he made it happen. He knows that you have to shape the world with your own two hands to make it work, and no one's going to do it for you. And Padme, of course, comes from this whole different world. She's the first woman to consistently show him kindness outside of his own mother, so he intensely falls for her, probably to an unhealthy degree. <laughs> But he also doesn't know what healthy looks like. Later at night, when those two are by the fireplace, she tells him that given their positions, him being a Jedi and her being a senator, that their love is impossible. Society will not allow them to be together, given their stations. But Anakin started out as a slave. If he had stayed within the rules that society had built for him, he wouldn't have left tattooing. So Anakin only sees those rules as an obstacle to what he wants, which is love. So he convinces her that if they keep it a secret, it'll be okay, and she knows that it won't be okay. But the lie they share, that it will, allows them to be together. And then soon after that, Anakin is having dreams about his mother that he left behind on tattooing, the one that he never freed the way he promised her, the one that the Jedi never really seemed to care about, because in the opening of the movie, when Anakin is in the elevator with Obi-Wan, and Anakin's saying, hey man, I'm having dreams about my mother. Obi-Wan says, dreams will fade in time. That means that they're banking on his emotional attachment to his mother fading in time. Soon after that, Anakin is having nightmares about his mother suffering in captivity. So he goes off to find her with Padme. He meets the man who bought his mother, who married his mother, Klee Glars. He tells Anakin that Shimi got captured by Tusken Raiders. Klee led a party of 30 out to get her back, but only four survived. Klee tells Anakin to accept his mother's death like he has. But Anakin knows his mother is alive. And like always, he's on his own to fix the problem, because this is the world he came from, far across the galaxy from the democratic niceties of the social contract that governs the Republic. He knows that only intense brute force will solve this problem, and the Jedi were not there when he needed them. Only Padme was there. So Anakin hops on a speeder bike to go find his mother, and he finds her. And she dies in his arms, choking out a final 
I love you to her long-lost son. So proud of him, and so happy that he made it out. And then he gives into his anger and massacres the entire village of Tusken Raiders. Because why wouldn't he? Why would he care about the Jedi teachings? Where were they when his mother was captured? The next day, Anakin is blaming himself for Shimi's death. Padme tells him, there are some things that no one can fix. You're not all powerful, and he tells her, well, I should be. I will become the most powerful Jedi ever, and I will even stop people from dying. And then he confesses the sins of his massacre to Padme. And then she just holds him as he grieves the loss of his mother. Her death just enforces the idea that he's isolated, that he's on his own. That he can't really count on the Jedi, the system, because he knows. He knows the system's not made for him. In his heart, he's a slave. And the Jedi, if they really cared, they'd grab Shimi, but they didn't. And these ideas come to a head in The Revenge of the Sith. Because in the opening of the movie, Padme tells him she's pregnant. And it's the high point of his life. Because he's come so far from where he began, Anakin lives in the seat of galactic power on Coruscant in a high-rise tower married to a member of the political ruling class. And he's pretty much done it all on his own. He's always been an outsider due to the class he was born into. But he worked his way into the upper levels of society. And soon after she tells him she's pregnant, he starts having dreams nightmares about her dying in childbirth much like his mother and he knows that the jedi will be useless in protecting her and saving her just like his mother he knows he's on his own because anakin asks yoda about dreams and yoda just tells him to let go of the things he fears to lose and so a desperate man in search of a way to save the only woman he's loved outside of his mother finds the Dark Lord of the Sith, Chancellor Palpatine. At an opera, Palpatine says the quiet part out loud. How all those who gain power are afraid to lose it, even the Jedi. And then Anakin, having been a soldier all of his life, responds with scripted dogma, saying the Jedi are selfish. They only think about others. But Anakin knows in his heart that this is false. Palpatine tells him that the Sith know how to bring the dead back to life. And Anakin has found his solution. He's picked his side. As a Trojan horse, as a fifth column, to massacre the Jedi from the inside, to kill all of the younglings. And Anakin goes along with this, because what has democracy done for him? What have the Jedi done for him? A desperate man who does what he can to save his wife no matter how much brute force it takes. A wife that has been there for him since he was a boy. A wife that the Jedi would forbid him from loving, let alone help him save. Of course, from his point of view, the Jedi are evil. Because to Anakin Skywalker, Padme Amidala is the ultimate good. Because anyone who falls short of Padme Amidala must be evil. Even himself, 